Good day, everyone. My name is Philippa Duffy, and I'm the director of RSA Oceania. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's very special RSA online event. Before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this event was recorded, the Gubby Gubby and Turrible people of North Brisbane, the Kwandamuka people in Brisbane's Bayside, and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all traditional custodians across Australia, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture the land. This was, and always will be, Aboriginal land. Recently, I had the privilege of yarning with two of Australia's leading Indigenous thinkers, Professor Norm Sheehan and Tyson Yunker Porter. Norm is a Wiradjuri man, born in Mudgee, New South Wales. A Professor of Indigenous Knowledge at the University of Queensland, he is recognised as contributing significantly to the development of Indigenous knowledge as an academic discipline and is responsible for shaping the first Australian Bachelor Degree of Indigenous Knowledges and the first doctoral degree in Indigenous philosophy. Tyson is the acclaimed author of Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. The book outlines Indigenous ways of thinking and producing new knowledge through a respectful dialogue based on reciprocity rather than competition. It imparts an impression of creation and how we might follow that pattern in our lives and systems. Nathan is a member of the Appalach clan in far north Queensland and is a senior lecturer in Indigenous knowledges with Deakin University's Nikari Institute. I hope you enjoy this amazing yarn. If you want to get involved in the conversation on Twitter, please use the hashtag join the regeneration or you can add your comments to our YouTube chat. Hey, hey. Yarn. I'm pretty good. I don't know if you can see that there, Ak, but that's the bees are swarming here. Oh, yeah. I can't see the bees. Yeah, can you hear them? I mean, they're all up around that tree. Hey, <laughs> you probably can't see because of the just camera, but um, yeah, they're all up around the tree there, millions of them. All right, there's a big oh. swarm there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Megan in the middle of a, an emergency. <laughs> like uh, one of your biggest fans. It's action station here. We've got a bit of information action relation going on here. <laughs> yeah, we, we deployed the Sheehan algorithm this morning. Oh, like, right. Like, 10 minutes ago, and then the bees all went nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking any responsibility. No, for it's your fault. You did it's it. My yeah. That's my oh, That's it. your algorithm. <laughs> it's that one uh, bracket less than sign I equals A greater than sign less than sign A equals I uh, greater than sign bracket R. Oh, yeah. Action equals information one. and information equal, equals action relations. Yeah. 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 But just that uh, right. that idea of action relations was the the one for me. This might actually be a really great place to start the conversation. Um, but before I do, let me just say once again, thank you both so much um, for allowing me to speak to you today um, and for allowing me to share our conversation with our audience. Um, we're really, really grateful to have you here and I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Um, so thank you both. <laughs> Um, Norm, I know that action relation is foundational to the way that you um, describe Indigenous knowledge, and it's also um, fundamental to your thesis and also Tyson's book. So um, could you just explain a little bit further for our audience? I've been carrying this around for years. Every now and then I just opened a hey, um, page, read a paragraph and then spend a week thinking about that. A couple of weeks ago, I had a big, long argument with people about, you know, you can't define Indigenous knowledge. And then I went back to that thing and had a look and I defined it in there. And I remember the supervisor <laughs> said to me, <laughs> you have to define it. And But I defined it as non-rational but relational. And um, 
probably for me the biggest thing is visual images, like um, writing stuff, like your book with the images. The images connect you to the story and that sort of doing is very much what it's all about, you know, um, and making things connect you to the story and the places. It's all that stuff that that the doing of it, as one of my students taught me, really good thesis he wrote, said, um, doing explains everything. Um, so, um, yeah, that algorithm, that comes from um, a book by, um, oh, I think it's... Um, Yeah, it's that book where the lady talks about um, being by the river there uh, up in Northern Territory and uh, um, uh, a march fly bites her on the leg and she says... Crocodiles. Yeah, it's just that fly is telling you a story. It's telling you that um, we can go and collect some crocodile eggs for tea. And she said, what? That's and, it. and that's that relations and information, the way information works in natural systems and how they are stories um, that tell us uh, things. There's that information theory of biology um, I've seen coming up lately that they're, they're starting to look at. So they're looking for, uh, they're looking at, um, Ecosystems, not as the things, but as the um, the information, the informatics of, of the system, as being what uh, what moves the system. So that's where the uh, Western science is starting to look now. <laughs> In, yeah, starting to understand that, uh, see that there's communication going on there. See for our way that um, the knowledge is in is in that system. It's it's in it's in the thing, you know. As you talk about the ant knowledge, yeah, the ant knowledge is there. So it's there in that uh, it's there in that system. It's there in that ant. There in the nest, in the uh, sort of ant place. Um, thesis. I also call it an intelligence. Intelligence. Yeah. So that that idea that yeah that country is alive. And intelligent and knows holds knowledge that that whole thing um, yeah very much um, you know very much part of um, yeah way of understanding that the West hasn't been able to grasp mm. and that's for me that's very much. Uh, you know, the importance of it because it is, uh, I think when we were talking about it last week, I, I wrote in um, with the group of people I'm working with um, that it's um, an extended mind. Mm. So our mind through country becomes extended to country and then on through the tracks and the song lines and everything. And it can extend out into lots of places. That intelligence, that's something that um, contrasts diametrically, exactly opposite to Western religion. <laughs> but um, yeah, so yeah, I think the, um, the that idea of doing what country does and how it does it and uh, Really, really beautiful thing. Mm. You know, for a long time, a lot of decades, when they're looking at systems, they were looking at it like a machine, you know. Um, that was the mm. story they were using for that. That was the wrong story. Um, they were looking at it like machines. <clears throat> um, you know, with all the different moving parts that sort of move together. Um and then they they sort of kept as they kept exploring, looking. Then they changed that up again, and they started to look at systems as um, uh, networks, 
So it was, you know, everyone's talking about networks for a couple of decades, you know, since about the nineties. And then, then they start looking at systems like, um, like now they're, they're looking at uh, ecosystem, ecosystem, you know, everything's connected. It's, um, you know, uh, it's mycelium. There's mycelium in the, in the soil. The trees are talking to each other and exchanging things. There's, oh my goodness, everything's connected. There's all these informatics, you know, happening throughout this ecosystem. Um, so starting to look like that. Now that they're, they're nearly there, they're like just a couple of wrong stories away from <laughs> landing in the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> Here at the uni, they're talking about they're bringing the ATSIS guidelines as the basis for research in this uni. The, the thing they're talking about was all of this and that, and, and I said to them, have you thought about what a respectful science might look like? Stop them in their tracks because science isn't respectful. Science thinks that what it's dealing with is all just matter that organises itself and it's smartest person in rooms the human. And um, yeah. the world is actually much, much smarter than us. And um, when you're respectful, you know, you respect country and you do the best you can around stuff, country sees that and responds. Mm. And when you know mm. country and you you, you know, you protect its stories and share its stories. Well, it responds to that as well. And when you don't, it responds too. So, you know, all this stuff, um, and I'm saying to them, all these things that are people fear, like um, climate change and COVID and everything else, essentially come about because there's disrespect not respecting animals, not respecting, um, you know, what a, what a jet engine does to the atmosphere. And um, just seeing what, you know, what the payout is today. Um, there's this sort of, uh, the idea that connection is just a... Uh, a randomness, um, that's not true. Connection is connection. It's the only thing, thing that exists. That interaction, um, mm. I think, think, is yeah. the way things interact with us and we interact with them. That's what everything's made of. Mm. And yeah, there's just um, such transformations that happen with that. You can recognize it. Anyone can recognize this is a self-organizing system, you know, country. Um, but then self-organizing it as a self, self-organizing its intelligence. It's just, um, it's not hard to make that leap and see that you're dealing with a sentient entity. You know, yeah. all those parts moving, connecting together like neurons in a brain, you know, and that we're just some other neurons in there. Um yeah, you can't stand outside yeah. of that system and observe it. I'm really curious to know what role education plays in this. Um, I think it's pretty clear that most Western and settler societies have lost um, those fundamental relational bonds with, um, with land, with place. Um, so should we be bringing Indigenous knowledge into our education systems so that kids can develop that respect for the land and, and that connection to country um, from a really early age. There's a book called The Doctrine of Discovery, and it's written by a Native American guy called Miller, and one of the people who writes about the Australian side of it is Larissa Berent, and they talk about the, um, the papal bull, 1492, 1493, mm. Mm. It said, essentially, anything you discover, you can own and do whatever you like with. There's no need to know it because it all has to be converted to knowledge of Christ. And so this Western European thinking directed by that um, 
took on the world as just a game to get credits to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And you could do anything you liked on earth, destroy anything on earth, and the, the benefit is, yes, if you do this for the, you know, for the church, you'll go to heaven. Um, and then you have all the end of the world cults, you know, the, the, um, the end of days. Um, so there is actually a very strong cult, a very strong series of cults and, and belief systems that are about the destruction of natural systems and the people who maintain them. And it's been in place for um, a good couple of thousand years. Uh, you know? So the whole idea of it being something, a problem that humans can solve, it's not because humans are the ones who generated the problem. And you'll find in any system, a system that generates a problem can't be applied to solve the problem it generates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a self-terminating algorithm. Well, it's like like you say about ants, and an ant is nothing on its own. Just an ant on its own, there's nothing to study because it doesn't exist. It'll no. just it'll die. It'll die really quick on its own. There's just nothing there. It doesn't know what to do. It doesn't have anything, you know. And um, everything is like that. Look, Philip, how all this comes back to education is, um, I think, the most abusive sentence on the planet right now is the children are the future you know <laughs> that's a lot to project onto them it's like you're the future <laughs> right now you know oh the children of the future oh, so you know it's 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 a lot to project on, onto onto young people you know and for what they, they're going to find their own way but everybody wants to try and control it you know so that's why schools are the front lines uh, for the culture wars. Everybody, schools aren't there for kids. They're there for adults. A, to lock up their kids in the daylight hours, and B, to, to fight their battles, their, their ideological battles. So what's the first thing if somebody hears something that they think is true and they want to get behind it and promote it and have that story come out on top and beat all the other stories and be the story to end all stories and the unified theory or whatever. First thing they say, first words out of their mouth, that they should teach it in schools. They should teach it in schools. And like, you know, and we do the same thing. It's like, you know, hey, indigenous knowledge is important. They should teach it in schools. It's like, I, I don't really care what happens in schools. You know, if I could keep my kids out of it, I would. Um, you know, this is coming from a, an educator <laughs> who's like been right through from kindergarten to, you know, doctoral level. I've seen every part of it and worked in it. I've, I've never been able to get out of this education since I was four years old, you know. And um, I, I don't know. I wish I wish they'd just leave the kids alone for a bit. Just leave them be. You're absolutely right, Tyson. And, you know, as the mother of two kids... Um, I couldn't agree with you more that that burden of responsibility is a terrible, um, terrible thing to place on the next generation. Um, but the other thing that that really concerns me is that, you know, our kids are going to um, inherit this broken world that we've created. And I can't help but feel that we haven't and, and we're not adequately preparing them um, or giving them the tools that they need to do this. Uh, so it's almost like they're doubly damned in a sense. So what hope do our kids have for the future? The, these poor kids. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're, we're just projecting stuff onto them while we, you know, these generations, Gen X and the boomers extract the last whatever they can from the land and turn it into capital. Uh, the land itself is capital and there's just, there's, there's nothing left for them. They're, they're the future in terms of that they're going to have to clean up. You know, they, they're going to have to be the ones to start the thousand mm. year cleanup um, and, and, and all the rest. <laughs> and I can't see that there's that much that they, they're going to learn at school. I mean, I, I don't know. I've been trying to solve the puzzle of how to teach indigenous knowledge in schools for years. Um, 
you know, how, how do you do it? I mean, I can do it if I'm just there with the kids, but, you know, it, to actually write a curriculum that anyone's going to be able to follow, um, to be able to learn, you know, um, the, the IK, the Indigenous knowledge that's, that's you know, going to help them to understand understand these systems and um, to understand the, the secrets of those systems and how to navigate it and care for it, you know, in the right ways, um, you know, it, it, that's, that's not going to happen in a school, you know, um, that'll happen on country, but not on just, you know, the occasional excursion to country. And it's like, hey, uncle, show us how to throw a boomerang. Artie, make us a damper. Um, you know, tell us a dreaming story. story. And, and, and there, look, you know, we've been out on country now, finished. Um, that's not it either, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it is really tricky. As soon as you take something into the education system, as you know, in unis in particular, people are so hungry for something new, you've got to look out. They'll knock you down and take it off you change it around, um, try and make it something that belongs to them. And then, of course, it doesn't work. And they say, oh, this stuff never works. But the reason it doesn't work is because they want to own it. They want it to be their idea. And for me, I, I think, um, you know, you sit down with kids, they're way quicker than me. Um, and... The kids really do things quite well. The idea that a curriculum is building minds is just stupid. Um, minds are already there. They, they come. The software's already installed. <laughs> They're already there. Yeah. Mm. Um, and it's the damage that that causes things to go wrong. So I think that caring thing um, and teaching kids how to care for each other and themselves—that's part of our culture. Um, and the competition thing, when it gets to be this one's got more points than the other, that's when it starts to fall apart. Yeah. But schooling, for me, um, I'm pretty much the same. Um, my was in a place um, not far from, um, from Melbourne, um, sort of, uh, you know, Ballarat and out there and those places in Catholic institutions, and the schooling we got was real survival schooling. How to survive uh, the violence, and the violence was pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you do get beaten in the middle of the night by a priest in a system, you get up the next day and you can't make your bed because your hands are all bruised or you've been kicked in the back and you can't bend over. So um, the system, then you get into trouble for not making the bed properly. Mm. You go into the classroom, your hands are all bruised from being hit with a leather strap. You can't write a book properly, so you get into trouble. So it builds up. Then you go to play sport. You can't play sport like you used to. You can't catch the football. You can't do that stuff because... You've been injured and nobody sees the injury. Now, I think schools are very much the same. There's this competition thing and people who hold power, um, like you said, the system is set up to serve very particular elites and it is a cruel system that damages people and then refuses to see the damage that's done. And then you have all these kids growing up with huge damage mm. and nobody acknowledges it. And that's the real violence, the refusal to see the damage. Yeah. So, uh, and I think looking at the, the kids who are um, in the King's Colleges and the, the, you know, the top Catholic schools, they're probably the most damaged. Yeah. And they come out, they come out as, you know, politicians or... Um, lawyers or whatever, but they're damaged people. Yeah. They're not whole people. And <clears throat> I think that that getting kids to an end country, if anybody can get into country and get covered in mud and dirt and learn stuff, it's a little kid. And they're not allowed to do it. Yeah. Well, what's the main, what's the main stated goal of uh, public education? 
in our system. It's that it's always the same goal. You know, you hear it as a teacher over and over. It's in all the documents. But the main goal is to prepare students for the workforce. You know, mm. it's about preparing students for the workforce. It's about um, breaking them, breaking them in a certain way, like a horse, you know, to be able to take that load. But then also it's about, um, mm. it's about s- establishing their place in the caste system as well. So, you know, all the students in a school, in a region, in a state, they go through schooling and they're placed they're placed in a sequence in order from one to a hundred and assigned a number and the bottom half are stuffed and the top half will be slaving away forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they, yeah. And, but you know, they'll be fine. They'll have enough to eat. They'll have a roof over there. The bottom half are going to be a lot more precarious. I mean, that's the idea. And they'll be zoned then into certain parts of the city onto that side of the tracks and that'll be policed, you know, if they're out in the wrong place, you know, that's when they're going to find that violence there, that state violence. Um, you know, this is how these things work. That's what schools are for. Um, and the idea of like, oh, well, you know, we're going to be inclusive and bring in Aboriginal perspectives <laughs> into that concentration camp of an institution. It's just uh, sometimes that's laughable to me. You know, that the, the main goal is to prepare students for the workforce. That's it. And, you know, we're entering an era now where most people are going to be irrelevant and they don't know what they're going to do with all these irrelevant people. How are they going to live? How are they going to stop them from um, just uh, tearing the place apart? Um, what are they going to get all these people to do? You know, so they're building, a, um, they're building the metaverse now. <clears throat> they're building a digital a digital twin of the world, basically, and of any kind of worlds that people can imagine. It's Ready Player One now. They're working on that. The kids will be expected to go into that, I suppose. But, you know, it's um, they're, they're being trained right now for a workforce that was, for an economy that was, and for a world that was. It, it, it doesn't exist anymore, and it's not going to exist when they leave school, but they're still being trained for that. You know, it's... um. Yeah, it's it's a nightmare. We still all have all the same goals for education and we're still following the same policy, uh, policy for a world that no longer exists. Um, you know, it's 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 pretty damn grim. So, you know, for me, when I when I think about indigenous knowledge, I'm, I'm you know, I'm like you that. Um, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's not going to happen um, in a room under fluorescent lights um, on a desk on a worksheet. Um, that's, that's not where that comes. I don't really care what they what they have to do there. In fact, I'd rather that they weren't writing. I don't know. I'd rather that they weren't thinking they were getting Indigenous knowledge on that worksheet. I'd rather that they weren't, you know, um, doing a, a, a vocab test or a comprehension test on a dreaming story because, you know, it's inclusive. Um, you know, I saw what that did to my kids going through and all the token stuff they did at school and how it, it broke them. Um, you know, all of that indigenized content, um, you know, it made them hate themselves. There's a thing there that happened um, with our Caring for Country program that we brought into university a few years back. And um, we set it up so that it was learning on country. We set it up so we had, you know, senior men and women guiding the students to this place and, you know, the big event at the end the, the program was uh, fired out on country and um, it affected the students so much and the big thing that affected them was um, a particular place where the uncle was talking. Um, there'd been massacres there and people had lived there and survived there for a long time. Um, and he was talking about it, and when he was talking about it, they were standing around in this spot in the bush, but then this really strange cold wind came, and mm. uh, it sort of blew on the backs of people, and people gathered together closer, and um, then everybody realised that the wind had changed and there was this cold wind blowing on their backs. And that they'd come closer together, 
and it get got a bit scary and freaky for them. And he said, no, that's all good. That's part of understanding what this place means. Now, um, <laughs> there was uh, bioscience students in that group. I think there was eight of them in that group. And they got together and wrote a letter to the university council and said, this is the best learning we've ever had. You should have this learning as part of yeah. the university. So what did they do? Well, they pushed all the Aboriginal the side because they know education better. And they said, okay, we're going to have that as the main theme for the university from now on. And But done token way with no content, no senior people involved, no um, uh, independent, free-flowing curriculum, but a curriculum that's written. And, of course, it becomes something that damage to people than good. You know, yeah. the, how do you get these things to work? Well, you, you can't get them to work in this system. Yeah. You can get um, halfway things to work, some part of the way but probably if anything you can direct students out to places where they can get it to work with family and community mm. and that's that's it you know they, they have these you know things in place where they go yeah right no these things must be indigenous led uh this must center indigenous voices we've got to have indigenous people doing this you know and so they put uh they put us in there to design these exact same curriculum again. And we all have KPIs, you know, performance indicators um, as to whether we're doing that job properly. And they're like, well, what's your outcomes? What's your global outcomes? What's your unit outcomes? What's, what are your objectives? You know, um, you know, when you go out on country, so the wind is going to blow on their backs, right? <laughs> uh, well, what's a, okay. That'll be, uh, that'll be in week three. In week three, the freaking wind will blow on their back, <laughs> and you know, uh, uh, so so countries going to teach them about cohesion. And it's like, no, <laughs> it doesn't work like that, <laughs> you know. Um, but that 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 is how the world works. And do you want to eat? Do you want to <laughs> eat? Do you want to have a roof over your head? Do you want to be arrested? How much are you going to, you know, how much will you sacrifice so that you can master? you know, um, what it takes to demonstrate compliance uh, for this system that's killing the land that should be teaching you, you know? How much are you prepared to give? And, well, a fair bit for at least half of us. Mm. You know, there's a big uh, Aboriginal middle class now. We've, we've, got, uh, we've got quite a middle class happening. You know, people have learned what they need to learn and, you know, are doing things Everyone's acknowledging country and there's welcomes to country. And, you know, <clears throat> we do speeches, you know, 40,000 years of nuts and berries and we do all this stuff and everybody applauds it. It's, um, you know, we're included. Um, it's inclusion. You know, we, <laughs> we're, we're, we're also allowed to have the benefits of some of the capital, not much. It's some of the capital that's that's extracted from country while while the last of it's being destroyed. That it's called a struggle because it is a struggle. Um, keeps on going. Yeah. Um, every now and then, you know, you get the flashes where good things happen. Um, you get the flashes where you see that the energy is still positive and alive in country. And it's much more than the flash that you get in the, you know, in the church or the confessional. Yeah. It, it's actually a real flash. And um, I, I sort of look at that as part of, you know, what we do as a people. I think um, the strongest stuff I've seen lately is the cultures of repair stuff. So there's a couple of young nephews um, young Clinton Schultz and young Tristan Schultz. They're um, brothers. They don't get on, but by golly, they're smart. And they um, they do get on, but they're brothers, so they've got to fight all the time. But they talk about cultures of repair and um, cultures of sustainment and how you actually keep this stuff alive while the 
while the mainstream culture is pulling stuff apart. Mm. And that's something that we've, our communities are really, really good at, keeping it going while all this other stuff is happening. And, um, you know, the old uncle who, who worked mostly with me, um, he was the one who stood up, gave me, um, gave me all the support for, for a long time. He used to talk about his car, his uh, 1924 DeSoto that he bought out near Kanamala or somewhere. And he said um, he, he drove it out to go to a new job. We got five miles out of the road, down the road, got a puncher. So I like, damn, fixed it. Drove it over a few miles, got another puncher. Damn, fixed it. And then he... He said he realised that the punches were on the inside of the tube because all the spokes in the wheel were loose. As soon as he hit a decent pothole, it would puncture the tube. So he said he was too far from town then. So a couple of hundred puncher repairs later, he got to his job. And every time I talked about the university, he used to talk about this loose spoke wheel. And um, the loose spoke systems, they, they self, they cause the destruction. They cause the workload. They cause all this because in the centre, there's no integrity. And that's how he described it. Um, and that, that centred ontology, that centred Western ontology, it is very, very fake. And it, exists to maintain a few people comfortable in the middle there and um, <clears throat> people never touched by anything because this whole system is turning around in circles keeping the rest of us busy so um, the system the smartest system it'll find an answer to this don't know what it will be don't know whether it will include people but um, it'll certainly be a good answer um, over after a period of time, things have dreaming, you know. Eventually, we got dreaming for water buffalo. I even seen, um, you know, cane toads now <laughs> starting to find their place. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, it, it pretty much it, everyone except settlers is a uh, pig, dog, everything. Come into place now and has dreaming, but um, yeah. So I keep I keep saying it again and again. But if we can't bring um, settlers, every settler back under the law of the land, um, then it's it's all finished. That, that reminds me of something that you said, Norm, at our last event, which was that um, you know this this, and you say it again in your thesis actually, which is that the dichotomy um, concerning Western and Indigenous knowledge is a divisive construct of colonialism um, that highlights the real situation as we see it. And that real situation is that some people have forgotten that they are indigenous. And I just wanted to, yeah, get your thoughts on that. Mm. Well, I, I remember um, way back in the seventies, attending a thing about, um, I think it was down in Melbourne, or, or it could have been in Tasmania, but um, I, attended the thing and a guy was giving a lecture about the environment and talking about David Suzuki, um, the big environmental activist back then. And he, he said, you know, we've been sitting in this room for half an hour listening and by now we're breathing out and breathing in and we've shared so much molecular content. Um, and these days, you know, it's really, really obvious with COVID and wearing face masks, we're sharing stuff all the time. We don't live isolated. But this idea that you can isolate um, and that people are separate and individual, that's, um, that's the core of it. And if anybody's going to pull it down and destroy it, it's the ego-driven people who want to own things. And 
colonialism is essentially about the takeover of the world by those sort of people. So the idea of the idea of law is something that you know it, it it's really hard to even say the word because the power of it is beyond anything. It's beyond human understanding, and that's why it works because we're too dumb to make it work properly. It's beyond our understanding. We can get glimpses of it. We can respect it. We can follow it as much as we can, but it's beyond us. That's why we used to have those times when people would meet and get together because that's what we did. We, we tried to understand and nobody being the one at the front holding up the crucifix, knowing everything, nobody yeah. knowing that. So for me, I, um, I look at the system um, that, that we live under. It's starting to fall apart. And for me, um, this place, this place is really a powerful place. Mm -hmm. The earth, um, it, it's something much more than all of us. You know, so let's say, well, there we go. That's that's a really important thing, that indigenous governance model. All right. Let's, uh, oh, it's really important. They should teach it in schools. You know, so how do we, uh, so what do we do? Do we make worksheets for that? Do we do a unit on governance? You know, but it's, um, it's not like that. You know, you, you get the kids and, and there's a task, like a difficult task they have to do, you know, in teams. So you get them in three teams and you say, all right, so, uh, you know, this team's going to do an indigenous uh, collaborative governance model. You know, here's what that looks like. Here's what your roles are. This team's going to do a liberal consensus, bloody progressive governance model. And this team's going to do a, um, a command and control, you know, business governance model. Um, now, all of you, you know, try and do the same, try and do that same task and we'll see uh, what happens and then report back after. You know what I mean? It's experiential. They're doing something. You know, they're actually applying it. It's an action relation you know, going on there, you know. Um, there was a time when you could do that. You know, I, I look at it um, as truth telling in front of the academic board uh, at my university. I, I stood up and I said, we can't have a, an Aboriginal um, program if it relies on the empathy because all the cultural competency things rely on, on the empathy of, um, of, of the mainstream. I said, because empathy is, is just a passing thing. It has to rely on respect. I've called and it that, training wheels. Empathy is training wheels yeah. for people who don't know how to relate yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the empathy thing. Um, and, and I said, you know, about is the actual truth this actually you fellas did this stuff here and it damaged people for generations and it's damaged you as well so respect means yeah for Wiradjuri people respect is the first step and um, there's all that really beautiful work done down there in Wagga by by the mob there talking around what respect actually is and um, it's not, um, oh, I respect this person because they're so great. It's actually a self saying, I really don't know. Mm. Um, I can't say if I want to find out what this might mean. I probably know the people I could bring together to talk about that. And then if we talk for a couple of days, we could probably say what it might mean yeah. a little bit. But we probably, at the end of that, wouldn't want to say it to these people. We'd have yep. to pick who we said it to. And so the whole idea of respect is that um, we don't live, we can't pretend that the world is inert. The world is alive. 
and it's smart. So we have to walk into it respectfully. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, that, that basic thing, that doesn't happen in education. They talk about respect in schools. Um, I think uh, my, uh, my schooling was very destructive. I became a very destructive person in school. Um, and I was really, really good at it too, because I'm cheeky and a little bit smart. Same. So I was very, very destructive in school. I failed school all the way through. And some of my failures were so well planned. <laughs> but the thing is that um, that whole idea of how do you learn in this context People have to change their culture. And the West is used to fighting wars over culture. You have to learn how to respectfully adjust your belief system so it matches with the world because your belief system doesn't match with the world. That's why all this stuff is happening. Mm. And can you do that? That's probably the hope for the future is the people who are respectful, who live in places, who yeah. watch things, who understand things. Well, um, those people who, who are respectful, they have knowledge, therefore they have authority. And that's a different thing from power. You look at Nietzsche, he talks about that, that um, will to power, how every living mm -hmm. thing has that will to power, and that's what makes the plants grow. And it's like, nah, <laughs> no for us. It's not will to power, it's will to relation. It's will to relation. The plant's not trying to be the most fabulous plant around and grow taller and greener and prettier than the other plants. They're growing to be in relation. Going to end up in the tummy of a kangaroo. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You don't want to look too pretty. <laughs> yeah, you've got to bring those beans in. Speaking of, well, so when I'm sitting in the middle of a bee swarm right now. My woman's panicking out there. She's probably putting out all kinds of pheromones for those bees, and they're probably stinging her to death right now. So I probably better get out there and help her out. Um, yeah. Once again, that's your fault. I think it's that's your fault because we started talking up your ant ant story this morning. I reckon <laughs> that's what did it. Just they were the nearest, nearest six-legged things, and they went nuts. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed that yarn as much as I did. You can find links to Tyson and Norm's work in the chat, as well as more info about the RSA's Regenerative Futures Program. This is the second time I've had the privilege of speaking to Norm, and I encourage you to check out our first conversation, which was part of our Reclaiming the Future series. We have a few more sessions yet to go in the series, so please do check them out. And thank you once again to Professor Norm Sheehan and to Dr. Tyson Yonker-Porter. And thank you all for watching.